Good morning, people of God. Welcome to worship. Good to be together online and in person. Thanks for the gift of your presence. I want to say thank you to Eileen for your clarinet this morning. That was wonderful. Thanks for sharing your gifts with us this morning. Appreciate you being here. Uh, remember that we are in the process of collecting uh, new and slightly used and like new shoes now through October. Please drop them off on Sundays. There are plenty of receptacles around to do so. Uh, if you come during the week, there is a box outside the main office entrance, entrance A, for Monday through Saturday. It's time to clean out those closets. Uh, another th item of interest for you is in your bulletin as an insert. Our First Lutheran Generosity Team and our Endowment Team have been working together to plan a special guest and opportunity for next Sunday, the 25th. And here to talk about it with you are Art Holtquist, the Chair of Generosity, and Rick Deal, Chair of Endowment. Come on up, fellas, and thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks. Yes, on behalf of uh, your Endowment and Generosity Committees, uh, good morning. Uh, 32 years ago, uh, it seems like a long time ago, Pastor Brady and then Council President uh, Francis Daly came up with the idea of putting together a First Lutheran Endowment Fund to provide financial support for mission and ministry within First Lutheran and also the greater Guilford County uh, area. Several years later, the T. Moser Youth Fund was established in memory of Taylor Moser by his family uh, to provide financial support for First Lutheran youth activities. Fund, or contributions to these funds are invested, and each year a portion of the annual growth is distributed in the form of grants, uh, yearly grants, through the grant process, and the grant process, hopefully you're aware, is underway for this year. Um, in January of this year, uh, 21 grants were awarded from the General Endowment Fund, and grants went to, for example, the Greensboro Urban Ministry Friday Morning Breakfast Group, uh, our handbell choir uh, to replace some of their handbells, uh, Charlie's Garden, uh, Jeff Zill, uh, a member of our church who you know well and who is going through seminary, and then also to Prince of Peace uh, in support of their summer youth camp. Um, likewise, four grants were awarded from the Taylor Moser Youth Fund, and these included monies for the National Youth Gathering, and although it was canceled for, I think, this year or was it next year, it is scheduled for later on. Uh, Boy Scout Pack 118, which is affiliated with uh, First Lutheran. Uh, our confirmation group uh, for their various activities. And then uh, to uh, Brooklyn Johnson, who is a member of our congregation and is working on her Girl Scout Gold Award. Contributions to these funds and others uh, are regularly made, as, as you read in the, in the bulletin and elsewhere, in memory of and in honor of First Lutheran members. Gifts have also been received as a result of legacy giving and uh, estate planning. And as Pastor Jay said, uh, you have an opportunity to learn more about this next week. Hi, good morning. Uh, some of you know me as Ginny's husband, but my real name is Art. Uh, I, I'm the chairman of the Growing God's Mission Generosity Campaign this year. Uh, and I'm here to let you know what's going to happen next Sunday. Uh, Stephanie Burke, who is a regional gift planner for the North Carolina Senate, will be here. She will be doing a mission minute in both services. And between services at, in the community center, she will be given a presentation and will be able to meet with you. And she will also be able to meet with you after the 11 o'clock service. Uh, she will be available to provide information on ways to navigate options to maximize your financial and estate planning goals. Her service is free to all members, and she's helped families realize their gift potential and effort of First Lutheran's mission and ministry. Uh, please join us there if you could, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.
Thank you, Art. Thank you, Rick. Um, just a quick word, and that is that uh, the service that Stephanie provides is free of service to anyone, and there is no strings attached or expectation or even uh, obligation to give to First Lutheran or the Senate or the ELCA. It's simply sitting down with you, asking some questions and going through some thoughts on what do you want your legacy to be and how do, would you like your estate and uh, estate and, and final plans of your giving to express your passion and that which you care about most. So it's very helpful. I've sat down with Stephanie's predecessor to do the, a very similar process in looking toward uh, you know, my retirement and beyond for how that uh, giving can continue uh, after I'm no longer here. So, and I don't mean as a pastor, I mean in this life, you know, after I've gone to be with Jesus, as they say. So um, it's, it's really good conversation and it help, helps you think about it from another perspective and, and from your faith in really important ways. So it's a big day here in First Lutheran uh, for two reasons. Uh, number one, we had a dedication of a child, not a baptism, but a dedication of a child in our 9 a.m. service. I'll speak more about that a little later. Uh, of a family who's connected to First Lutheran, have chosen First Lutheran as their faith community, where the father is a faithful Muslim and the mother is a faithful Christian. And they came to me months ago and said, after they got married here in 2016, they came here uh, months ago and said, how do we help bless Nora, their daughter, in the context of our chosen faith community in the way we are raising our child and uh, as we live out our faith together? So I'll say a little bit more about that in the sermon, the beautiful uh, service in which we welcomed Nora into fellowship, uh, Al-Sharit, uh, into fellowship of First Lutheran Church. And the other thing is that both services today welcoming our youth to take a milestone next step in their journey of faith. Uh, there are uh, 11 youth beginning confirmation this uh, season, and uh, most of them were present at the 9 a.m. hour to walk through the uh, milestone of beginning confirmation, which we do every other year. And there's at least one family here now, I believe, and I think that's all. If y'all would come on up, that'd be great. Uh, bring bulletins with you. And here's what we're going to do because, uh, you know, we don't want to put them on the spot. I even did this at the, at the 9 a.m. service with about eight or nine uh, families. And that is this half of the congregation right here. You are going to respond as and with the youth as a sign of support of, of their responses that they're going to share through the bulletin today. So you help the youth. Come on up. Come on up. Stand, gather around the font, and I'll join you there in a minute. But the Biggs family is here for this and wanted to share it with you because they usually worship here in traditional. And, uh, and also this half, you're going to respond with the parents. And again, as a sign of support, encouragement, and joining with them on their journey in, in confirmation. So I ask you all to stand as we help uh, share this milestone as we continue to focus on the promises God makes to us, we make to each other and to God through baptism. Let us begin. Welcome back to the baptismal font. We gather here today to remember the promises God made to each one of us and the promises we or our parents and godparents made to God. So, um, we welcome you to this exploration of faith called confirmation. In the waters of baptism, God named you, claimed you as a child of God. You were held in God's love now and forever. Confirmation. When your parents brought you to the baptismal waters, they made awesome promises to live with you among God's faithful people, to bring you to the word of God and the holy meal, to teach you the life and way of Jesus, to place in your hands the holy scriptures, and to nurture you in faith, prayer, and service, so that you may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and action, care for others and the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Parents? Parents, parents, <laughs> um, par parents and others who are significant in the life of these young people, do you recommit yourselves 
to keeping these promises. Parents to our youth. And youth. Thank you. At baptism, the congregation welcomed uh, you as a family member in Christ. The congregation promised to support your parents in nurturing your faith. So, do you, members and friends of First Lutheran Church, agree to continue supporting these youth and their parents as we walk this journey of faith together. We pray. God, you have claimed and embraced your children in the waters of holy baptism. Help these young people as they commit to explore their faith more deeply. Help their parents to continue their commitment to raise them in faith and help this community to support and encourage them all along the way. We pray for the sake of Jesus and his mission. Amen. Congratulations and welcome to the journey as it continues. Uh, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share God's peace as we are comfortable doing so with each other. Thank you.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. God among us, we gather in the name of your Son to learn love for one another. Direct our feet away from selfish pathways. Turn our minds to your wisdom and our hearts to the grace revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. My children who are present, join me for a children's message. Come on up if you like. Good morning. Have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. Thanks. All right. You see what I got? What are they? Yeah, I got some glasses. Um, why do people use glasses? Help them see better. Exactly. Help them see better. Um, in some cases, the eyes don't do what they used to do, um, so I've needed to use these. And in some cases, my arms aren't long enough anymore. So I, I, I have to use these things too. And when I read really, really small print, I put these on so I can see them better because I can't see them as good as I used to. But uh, glasses help us see better. Uh, some people need them to see better. So uh, today in our Bible reading, we hear from the prophet Amos. And Amos is trying to help God's people see better. He doesn't give them glasses, but he tells them they've got to understand that their actions affect other people. And instead of just looking from their own eyes, they need to look at others through God's eyes. 
we talk about faith and faith is like putting on glasses and instead of seeing things just with my own eyes i try to see others and life through jesus eyes i try to learn how jesus wants us to see life god and other people so it's like putting on glasses but how do we do that in our faith well we pray and we ask god to help us we read the bible and the bible stories especially about jesus and how he treated other people and we um, come to worship and we go to uh, our faith formation groups and classes and talk about faith with other people and there are plenty of other ways but ways we try to see other people and life not just through our eyes but jesus eyes god's eyes so i want you to talk about that in your family this week amos is trying to help people say your view is not the only view. You need to see this the way God sees it. And then as we live and love and share uh, faith in Jesus and follow Jesus, we get sometimes to the point where we can see better because we see things as God sees them. Talk about that in your family. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for glasses that help us when we want to see better or need them to see better. Help us also to find those ways that we see others and the world better, not just with our own eyes, but with your eyes as well. We love you, God, and we thank you. Amen. Thanks for coming up. The, les the lesson is from the eighth chapter of Amos. Amos proclaimed, Hear this, all you who trample on the needy, and all you who bring ruin to poor people of our land. You whine, saying, When will the holy days be over, so we may sell our grain again? 
And how long before the Sabbath ends, so we may offer wheat for sale? Let's make the bushel baskets smaller and the shekels we use heavier so we can deceive our customers with false weights on our scales. You think you can buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. You sell the sweepings of chaff as part of the good edible wheat. The Lord has made an oath before the arrogance of Jacob. You can count on this. I will never forget any of your harmful deeds. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. The Gospel of Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful, with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The good news of God for all people. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. I've got a picture I want to show you. Who knows what this is? Yeah, shorthand, right? Shorthand. How familiar are you with shorthand? Go ahead and read that to me. Oh, okay. Well, some of you can, right? Until recently, very recently, really, it was prolific in the business world, but it's becoming a lost art. I recognize it because my Aunt Betty used it uh, at work every day as a secretary for a bank president. And she showed me when I was a young child, she showed me uh, shorthand and how it works and what it means and how to write it. I don't remember any of that, but I at least know what it is. Well, there was a recent social media post of shorthand and it told what it was and how it was used. And lots of people recognized it and made comments about it. But what was funny, there was a large percentage of comments that thought it was a hoax. They didn't really understand it and they thought it was not real. And why? Because they had never seen it and they had never heard of it before. They thought it was unreal and they thought it didn't even exist all because it was not a part of their experience. Our Bible story today is a sermon from the prophet Amos. He's angry with the unethical behavior of the merchants and people doing business in the marketplace and he uses some very strong threatening language to get their attention. Merchants uh, in Amos's time are making the containers that hold the contents they sell smaller. Now the Hebrew word for the typical container was the ephah. The ephah is the Hebrew word which is a little larger than a bushel basket, if we're familiar with that. But that even of itself is archaic in many of our experiences, isn't it? I grew up uh, seeing bushel baskets that were from my grandparents' farm. And they are also making the weights that they use to count consumers' coins. It was called a shekel. They're making those weights heavier. Imagine this. We have a scale, an old-fashioned scale, with two little plates in which you place things, or bowls, hanging on chains from that little pendulum there. And you put the cost in shekels on this side, and then consumers put their coins 
on this side and it has to be of equal weight. Well, what's happening if they're making the shekels heavier? Obviously, people are paying more. The result is more money for less product. Can we relate to that? Maybe, perhaps. Uh, getting a little more wealthy as a result. I just read an article last week about the amazing shrinking can of tuna. You know, once it was seven ounces and maybe even larger beyond that, then it became six and a half ounces and then six and a quarter and even six and an eighth ounce for a while. Uh, then it was most recently six ounces and now some companies are putting out five ounce cans of tuna as their regular can of tuna. And um, they claim that two ounces is a serving and they also continue to raise the price as well. Well, what Amos makes the biggest deal about and why he invokes the anger of God against the merchants is not because they're trying to make a living and we know that people need to raise prices and inflation happens, but also he is making the point that they are seeing in a way that is too limited from their own perspective. They're seeing life and the transactions of their business from their own limited perspective and not, uh, and yes, it's a, a selfish or self-centered perspective. Amos points out that the poor and hungry people in their own neighborhoods are hurting already, but the practices of the merchants are making their life even worse. Amos points out that the merchants are not considering God's take on the effect of their merchandising, not considering God's perspective on what's happening. They don't see how it's impacting poor people around them because they're basing everything on their own narrow perspective. A lot like those people who saw shorthand and thought it was a hoax, thought it wasn't real because they had no experience of it. These merchants only see the benefit to themselves of the unethical behavior. They don't realize, perhaps, that their unethical behavior is seen very differently from those that are suffering and hurting. Amos demands that they see their behavior with God's eyes and realize that what they are doing is causing suffering and harm to people who are already hurting. He is demanding that justice, God's fairness, prevail. How often do you and I go through a day and forget that we are people of faith and we need to see life not just with our own eyes, but with a wider lens than our own? How often do we remember to go uh, just about, about life each and every day in a way that honors our faith trying to see things as Jesus sees them, not just as we see them through our own limited perspectives. This is the good news in this story and this reminder that Amos offers us today. It is an invitation for us of good news to look at life through God's eyes instead of just our own perspective. And to realize that when we do that, life can be better not just for us, but everyone, including our poor and hungry neighbors. It takes work. It takes reminders, doesn't it? And for Amos, it was so bad he had to invoke God's anger in order to get their attention to see what was going on. See it the way God sees. So how do we do that? It takes work. It takes effort takes intentionality, doesn't it? How do we find out God's view in our daily experiences? We talked about that some in the children's message, right? Prayer, scripture reading, reading those stories of how Jesus saw others and life. Um, also, having conversations among people of faith and getting to know others who are different than we are. Uh, it's, Amos tells the merchants they have to see their own lives and their own actions through the eyes of the poor people that are being harmed. They have to get to know the people they are making life more difficult for. And in so doing, they will see what God sees. Three quick notes to make or stories to tell 
about uh, experience today. We shared today, uh, Ben Biggs came forward with his family and we shared his milestone of continuing the journey of the baptismal promises with parents and faith community. And uh, the family said, yes, we're continuing this journey together as did uh, the other families at the 9 a.m. service. And we said, yes, that we're going to continue this journey with them because here's what happens. When we do this work and we start to get to know these young people, we understand that we see life differently and God differently and our neighbors differently as a result of investing ourselves in those relationships. Some of you remember back in February where we had confirmation of some of the young people of our, of, uh, our faith community and how they impacted our perspective of faith on that day through their stories and their sharing of their faith. It changes life and it changes our perspective and we see it God's way in a broader way when we get to know other people's stories. Another one happened just a little while ago in our midst this morning at 9 a.m. We celebrated with Taylor Bernstein Al Sharit and Ahmed Al Sharit the dedication, not the baptism, of their beautiful daughter Nora in worship at 9 a.m. When they first came to me as people who had uh, been married in this faith community back in 2016, uh, and they came as and still are a faithful Muslim father now and a faithful Christian mother. Uh, they came to me a couple of months ago and said, how do we celebrate this birth with the faith community that we cherish, being First Lutheran Church? How do we celebrate this knowing that we can't do a baptism at this point uh, in her journey or ours, but we need to acknowledge what God is up to in our lives and the lives of this faith community as we engage. And so we had conversation, and what I can honestly tell you is, as their pastor, at first I was not sure. I was a little uncomfortable. But the more I talked with Ahmed and Taylor and explored what we might do to bless Nora and to affirm and support their family and their faith, and to support Ahmed and Taylor, uh, I realized that God was up to something among us, something special in their lives and ours. Ahmed sees no reason for Taylor to give up her beloved Christian faith through First Lutheran Church. It is a part of what he loves about her. Taylor sees no reason for Ahmed to give up or compromise his Muslim faith. It is a part of what she loves about him. And as we talked further, together they are committed to raising Nora to appreciate and to learn both traditions of her family and to be a part of this faith community in whatever ways they can. So as I began to see their two faithful perspectives from their perspective and through their eyes and through their one mutual love in marriage, through the eyes and hearts of Ahmed and Taylor, I began to see Nora not just through the eyes of my role as Lutheran Christian pastor, but through the heart and mind of Jesus and of God. Nora is, as Ahmed and Taylor say, an amazing gift of love from God to us and to the world and to them. She is a gift of acceptance. She is a gift of reconciliation and healing. And I can see that so much better now after spending time with her parents. We are living in a world much different than the one I grew up in, you grew up in, and it demands looking at our practices and behaviors and our ways of living out our faiths together. When we take time to get to know what life is like and what faith is like for people who are different in some way than we are, it is holy ground. We start to gain perspective on what God sees and how God sees and what life looks like through the eyes and lens of Jesus. One last story. Uh, Cindy and I are trying to <laughs> clean out her mother's storage unit 
so she doesn't pay a hundred dollars a month for things she doesn't use or need anymore and I know those of you who have done that are saying good luck right but we're in the process of trying to do that I needed help with all the lifting my back won't do that anymore so we were looking around for someone to help me do that Cindy found out through a teacher friend about a young man who is an Afghan refugee who is doing odd jobs all weekend long because he is trying to get his degree and get his education up to speed and so he's in classes uh, Monday through Friday all day and all night and he's doing double time to get that uh, education he needs well he and I spent six hours together last Saturday and in those six hours I can tell you I learned more about what life is like for refugees from another culture than I have from all the reading I've done, all the studying I've done, all the workshops I've attended, and all the Zoom sessions I've participated in. And I've done those over several years. He talks about how hard it is to both work and go to school while also dealing with a language barrier and the temporary refugee status that he has to always deal with. He talks about trying to manage uh, on less income than he had before while also experiencing a higher cost of living. He talks about not being able to do the higher paying jobs that he was used to doing in his homeland uh, because here he is not qualified for them and doesn't have proof of the education he has gained. Uh, and he talked and he kept talking about his dreams and his hopes and his plans for a better life and how his faith in God drives that. He also talked about those who lead his home country by fear and violence and how they do not follow or represent his beloved Muslim faith. He talked about his and his family's take on all world religions and he talked about how uh, he uh, works with others to achieve cooperation and fairness and above all love one's neighbor no matter what. And he talked about how grateful he is for the love that people like us have had for him as his new neighbor. Well, after several trips between the storage unit and our home, I brought him by the church to drop something off. And as we pulled into the parking lot, he burst into a smile. And he said, you're the pastor of this church? He said, I know this church. He says, your people helped me and helped my roommates. Uh, we got some furniture here and some linens and some kitchen supplies. Your people are very, very helpful, and I am so thankful. It was funny because uh, he realized after he pulled in the parking lot and made all those connections and suddenly those memories of our helpfulness flooded over him. And uh, we weren't, he wasn't one of those households that we helped directly as we, did, we helped with three but he was one of the other households we helped with the leftovers that we had collected and the other help we had because of all your generosity and giving. Because of these experiences, young people in our midst continuing the baptismal promises with your help and support and encouragement. Uh, a family who has parents who are one Muslim, one Christian, and choose this as their faith community have given birth to Nora and shared with us in faith as the journey continues. And our work with refugees to uh, be Christ to our neighbor. Because of these experiences, in getting to know people who are different than me in some way, I have a new and better understanding of faithful, kind, and loving Muslims and refugees. And in doing so, I caught a glimpse of life through God's eyes. May we continue to do that as best we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join with me for the Apostles' Creed as we profess our faith together. Together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. 
He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Reminder, please get a hold of those Black Fellowship books and sign those and pass those along as a record of your attendance and participation. Thank you.
As scattered grains of wheat are gathered together into one bread, so let us gather our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of God's good creation. Good and gracious God, through the prophet Amos, you remind us that our limited view of life is not the only view. Through the prophet Amos, you remind us that there are often consequences of our actions in other people's lives that we may not be aware of. Remind us always to take the wider view. Remind us to see life, to see others through the eyes of Jesus. Lord of the journey, show us the way. Help us not to be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong. Help us not to be afraid to defend the poor due to the anger of the wealthy. Lord of the journey, show us the way. We thank you for the gift of creation that nourishes us like a mother who cares for her young as we receive the beauty and the blessings of earth in our lives. May we find strength to care for it and heal it for the sake of countless generations to come. Lord of the journey, show us the way. We lift up to you, O oh God, the family and congregation of Pastor Bill Zima. Uh, as we surround them as our sister church in their grieving, Freedom's Lutheran Church in Gibsonville. We trust you to help us as we walk with those experiencing grief to remind them and to know ourselves that your love and your life is larger than death. Lord of the journey, show us the way. We continue to pray for those who have asked for our prayers. And so we lift up to you now, Linda, Zach, Bonnie, Art, Paul, Emily, Bob, Lois, Nicole, Marcy, Shirley, Sarah, Marcia, and Charlene. As we gather today, there are other people we wish to pray for. So we take a moment now to name them before you, either silently or aloud. Help us, O oh God, as we continue to embody your compassion, your care, and your healing. Lord of the journey, show us the way. Gathered together in the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, gracious God, we offer these and all our prayers to you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our duty and delight that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, who calls us to follow his way of humble service and love. And so with the church on earth, all creation, and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. On the night of his betrayal, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. May be seated, communion assistants, please come forward. given for you body of Christ 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 given for you
the risen presence and the life-giving love of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for being part of worship today. Now go with Christ and go as Christ to love and serve God's world. Thanks be to God. Thank you.